many mammals as well. And I'll, I'll let Peter tell you what he's going to talk about, I think. Right, we've, we've had an interesting chat there. I'm going to talk um, about pure logic, reason, and numbers in economics, and avoid all forms of um, behaviour and opinion, or something like that. Um, a lot of the work I've done over the last 10 years is in the realm of environmental economics and its relationship with rewilding. And obviously, I, I've been a rewilder for many, many years, um, when it was unfashionable, I remember, when I was at Scottish Wildlife Trust some 20 years ago. Um, but we're going to talk about the ecosystem services, and I'm going to talk cool, hard numbers. So this isn't opinion, this is how economics works. And the thing that I find fascinating about beavers and understanding ecosystem services, beavers, is if we understand the economic processes that beavers represent in the costs and the benefits to people and find the true solutions to those costs and benefits, they're actually the solutions to so many of our problems in all of nature and society. Things like unemployment, poverty, the loss of nature, the waste of natural resources, and the economic solutions to the beaver problem are the same. We could have an unbelievable economic and environmental renaissance in Scotland if the Scottish powers, if the Scottish Parliament uses their new tax raising powers in a very wise way. So, what are the ecosystem services of beavers? Um, they definitely do all these things. They create biodiversity. They create dead wood, fungi, insects. They turn what is essentially barren land into wildlife rich land in all kinds of ways. And there's lots of studies around the world, and I've read most of them. We know that what they do for plants is quite amazing. The, all, the, the, the structure of beaver banks, how they give different habitats, and the type of aquatic vegetation and the water meadow vegetation. Amphibians, there's been a number of scientific um, studies. This one on the River Eiffel. Um, and you can see, if I can press this, that the yellow represents those streams in the Eiffel system that don't have beavers on it. That's the number of amphibian species and that is the number of amphibian species where beavers are. A huge change. And some of our most rare and threatened creatures, like amphibians, their future could be totally turned around by the restoration of beavers. We know that fish populations can boom in beaver habitat. Certain types of habitat will change immensely with uh, beavers. But change is the issue. And that is economics. So the food for fish, the structure, structural diversity of what's in the water allows certain fishes to evade predation, just like you have with rewilding issues on the land, changes a lot. And there are studies, certainly on some streams, that have shown 800 times more fish in streams where you've got beavers than when you don't. Birds. We've seen in this study in Bavaria that um, where you've got beavers can create a massive amount of habitat for birds. Um, it was in this study, 24 species were hugely benefited by the presence of the beavers. Also mammals. So we know this is this is the story that got me interested in beavers in the first place. 20 years ago, there's a Russian researcher. And I was looking at otter conservation, and he said in his studies, and this is in the 60s and the 70s, that where you had beavers on rivers, you basically had twice the population of otters. And he statistically proved it. Because I'm a bit of a nerdy statistician, I read all the statistics, and it was true. Those, those um, studies were also um, done in Finland and Sweden and Norway by some other researchers in the 80s. And again, it pretty much proved that on rivers, where beavers are, similar type of habitat, you basically get twice as many otters where beavers are and when they're not. 
It also proved with things like um, European mink. Yeah. But I think it, because waterfalls in this country are a little bit different to our continental waterfalls, I think very, very similar will happen with waterfalls in this country. So we've got, those are the sort of benefits to wildlife that we know can be pretty much proved, but what are the benefits to humans? You know, what's, where's the cash benefit? Where's this ecosystem service? Mostly it's water quality, it's filtration of sediments, there's certain river systems and reservoirs, the benefit of beaver will be worth millions because it costs a fortune to dig out the silt because it all silts up. The filtration of pollutants, the beaver wetlands, you know, the little nodules with all the bacteria, they will process some of the um, nitrates and phosphates, but some of the pollutants, pesticides, will be fixated into sediments and that will be turned into PG soil. You've also got um, the contribution that beavers play to flood prevention, definitely buffering of rivers across a whole river system, whereby you'll have better flows when there's no water in the summer, and you'll stop peak flows. And that water will recharge aquifers more quickly. There's a number of hydrological benefits that beavers do, and there are a number of economists go around calculating how much all this is worth. So. We've got flooding. It's, is it getting worse? Is it getting better? That's a complex question. The statistics are we've had more, more um, clustered effects in the last 30 years of rainfall. But over the last 100 years in Britain, you can't really say if we've had more rainfall or not. So there's no conclusive proof that flooding is getting worse. But this is an example of Boss Castle. And there are a number of flood events where we know those flood events have been primarily changed not by rainfall patterns, but by the destruction of the watersheds. So in the moors above Boss Castle, they've all been drained. And that water falls upon compacted soils and floods off them straight down into rivers and kills people. <coughs> and we've got to accept that. There's a number of flood events which are very dangerous to humans. And the cost is tremendous, absolutely tremendous. Millions and millions and millions of pounds so there's a real benefit that beavers could and other forms of rewilding. So, some people across the world have tried to create artificial beavers. This is the town of Belford in Northumberland, very close to where I come from. It started flooding. In the last 20 years, it's flooded a lot. Really nastily, never used to flood before. It was changes in agricultural drainage. It was intensification of the agriculture. It's a nice small valley, so it's easy to model. But the clever people at the Environment Agency said, we're going to not going to spend huge amounts of money on flood defences. We're going to create beaver structures. And they are beaver structures. You can see here, at the bottom of a farmer's field, they've actually created a beaver pot, just as a beaver would. They have felled trees which stops um, high water flows, it, it points them out into the land and back and then should go into the ground and not flood down. This, you can't quite see it here, but this is a series of berms and obstacles that makes the water have to go much longer. You've got all the issues with the um, hydrostatic pressure and the, the resistance of water. It takes the energy out of the water, it slows it down. And all of this was well studied, and it worked. Stop the town flooding. But it cost many millions of pounds. Shoving beaver in there. And there's rental charges. They've got to pay the landowner now. So the landowner, he's the one who's drained his land better, that's caused the flooding. He doesn't have to pay for it. And now he's getting a nice bit of rental income from the taxpayer for having a pond at the bottom of his field. Mm. That's, that's not fair, is it? Cost benefits analysis, all that kind of stuff. If we start looking at the European Water Framework Directive and its ability to be implemented has been an utter failure in this country. Um, and that's because the structures they want to create along riverbanks, uh, in the watershed, strangely enough, are all the sort of things that beavers do. And the cost to do all that 
is astronomical, both in terms of human beings doing that work, but of course they've got to pay the rental value of the land or the purchase price of the land to acquire the ability to do it. And that's the real reason why the Environment Agency has not achieved anything in the Water Frameworks Directive, because they can only buy tiny bits of land which are ineffectual in changing watersheds. So, in a, the, the best case study in the ecosystem services that Beavers did is the one on the Jossa Valley in um, Germany. And they calculated that over a 25 year period, it would be worth 15 million euros. And a lot of um, economists could argue, was it 20 million euros, was it 5 million euros, whatever. And that's the kind of study that's coming through with people who will study ecosystem services that come out and say, these beavers are saving water and preventing flooding and doing things, water treatment, which will end up meaning that it's worth 15 million euros over so many years. But the problem is that's not how the economy works. The other issue I wanted to look at was salmonids and beavers and why people get so upset salmon fishers, when studies definitely show us, if we look around those scientific studies that have been done, that most people, where there are beavers around the world, don't think they're a problem. They don't. They've definitely proved that where you have beavers, where beavers in a number of systems have returned, the salmon numbers have gone up, and statistically, they're bigger salmon. So there's been a few studies, nothing really Conclusive, but not enough money doing it. So this was a great study in the um, I can't pronounce Norwegian. Um, in the war, but over a space of 36 years, no fishermen saw a problem with beavers at all. If we look at the sort of structures that they create, yes, they they change rivers, but they're not really stopping salmon and trout so, and salmon moving up the streams. Maybe in a tiny few cases, but statistically a very small amount, uh, but they're changing the habitat. Some habitats, like this one in California, what was a completely useless river is now a great river for trout and sap, and fantastic. And, but that's not quite what will happen in Scotland. But we've got to think about the tragedy of the privates. Some of you will have heard of the economic concept of the tragedy of the commons. If you actually read the tragedy of the commons, it's the tragedy of the unmanaged commons. Most commons were very well managed, and they were very, very productive. The tragedy of commons didn't really exist. But we have the tragedy of the privates, and this, I think, is the economic issue with salmon and fishing. You've got the economics of salmon and fishing, how people actually make money from salmon and fishing, and you've got, they are putting their labor and their capital into trying to create something, a fishing experience that's worth a lot of money. People will pay unfathomable <laughs> amounts of money to go and catch the right salmon. And if you've provided that labor and that capital to give your client the most fantastic experience in salmon fishing, that's great, and we should promote that. And we know generally across a river system, having beavers back will actually create more opportunities to fish. The problem is that with salmon fishing and trout fishing, you need the perfect bit where the salmon want to stop and avoid predation and be able to feed just right. Now, the beavers might move that 200 yards down, and that's not the only and you can't judge the water licenses. And that's the tragedy of the privates. The reason why the Angling Trust and our friends in the Tweed Foundation are so upset is not because they really disagree that beavers will destroy their fishing industry. It's because they're worried that their personal income of their business is going to be affected. And so we need an economic system that rewards the labor and the capital employed but gives greater mobility to the actual natural resource. The ownership of the natural resource becomes less important. 
That's how you solve the problem with fishing. So people won't scream and shout and hire PR people and fund organizations to come along and say, beavers are a terrible idea because they can still ply their trade. Mitigation and compensation strategies. The economic processes that we need to understand so we can rightly mitigate and transfer from those who benefit and those who lose out in beaver restoration. So the first thing, we've got to understand the role of land and economic rent. Because who benefits when beavers recolonize the Tate catchment? Where does the money come out? It comes out in the rental value mostly of Perth properties that aren't going to be footed anymore. That they have cheaper water bills and their insurance costs have done that. Also, those houses next to areas that look a bit nicer will have the rental value of that land. It's capital value. It's easier to measure rental value than economic. And so we like to talk about economic rent. They benefit. It is immaterial if you create more jobs because the way the economy works is the competition for jobs that decides um, wages is different to what the ecosystem services are. So the person who benefits are property owners, and normally quite a few property owners, who will benefit hugely from the return of the beavers in certain points, mostly build up areas, because that's where the, the true uplift in land values occurs. So you need a system that takes it from them and gives it to the poor farmer who's had his potato field flooded. And that's, the problem is, at the moment, the way we compensate people from general taxation means that we suppress jobs. We will lose, we will create poverty when you tax people's labor and their capital because there's less jobs around, there's less economic activity. So people fundamentally know that the system is broken when it comes to economics of reward, of cost and benefit. And you can't just say it that yes, we're going to get all these benefits from beavers, and then we're going to tax everybody and give it to the farmer. And also you have to say, well, that farmer took that land from the floodplain in the first place. So he's caused costs to other people. So you really need a system that can understand who benefits us and who loses. And that's what economics teaches us. Now, there's two ways of benefiting. One is mitigation. You can see here where we, we, we've, there's a simple, uh, in, um, where you've got a sluice, you build a beautiful beaver deceiver and use funds from people who've benefited to pay for things like that. And a beaver deceiver like that um, will really work. It does work. It'll solve all your problems. And in certain areas, you, this is what you want to do. You want to mitigate. And the way you decide what is mitigation and what is compensation is, is a different matter. We've also got areas where beavers will come and damage crops. Now, an electric fence is quite effective for that. Um, in certain areas, you want to farm, maximize the benefit of that farming. We know that beavers very rarely venture far from, from riverbanks. Probably having 20 meters of riparian habitat will solve a lot of problems anyway. How do we get that from the landowners who get, who use it and get it back to the wild and how do we compensate it. Again, it's, it's transferring the money from those who really benefit to those who lose it. And also, we can always remove beavers. So, the Bavarian model of mitigation is great. We need cash compensation reflecting the rental value exchange from the winners and the losers. And the re how we decide between the two processes is we need a fluvial geomorphologist to create a full model of the water catchment and decide where it's best to allow beavers to create wetlands economically and where it's best for farmers to farm, farm, farm and produce our food. And that's where we can have a perfect system whereby people genuinely benefit from it and are rewarded and compensated fairly. Understanding so, am I going back? Um, yes, the fundamental solutions to the problems are understanding the role of land and economic rent. And at the moment, we hide it from our economy because it doesn't suit 
people who control our economy, banks, certain governments, don't want to talk about economic rent, monopoly of any sort. They want to hide it because they've got their snacks in the trough and they 50% of everything you buy or do is economic rent. Then you've got your own taxes on top of it. You can't believe the deadweight, deadweight costs of monopoly upon our economy. It is frightening. It's why we have an unemployment. It's why we have poverty. Across the world, it's monopoly that is the problem. So we've got to internalize all the externalities of environmental destruction. And doing that, you can have an economy that will be green because we're robbing our futures. We've all farmed the tea, or people have farmed the tea, caused flooding to other people, but we're robbing from our children when we do it. So you need a system that limits that damage and allows the most economically efficient system to save what natural resources, the ecosystem services we need. So, this might think like new knowledge, but Scotland's greatest thinkers have already told us about this. All you have to go back is go and read Adam Smith's Wealth of Nation, William Ogilvie's um, The Birthright of Men and Land, John Stuart Mill's work, utterly amazing, Thomas Spence, my own personal hero, and of course Robert Burns himself in The Twa Dogs. Is that's what this poem was actually about. It's about rental value of land and natural resources and how it's costing people and the costs of society and the problems of that. They've all talked about it before and it's all been modelled before. It's the perfect way many green economists understand these problems. And it's not some woolly yogurt weaving thing. This is real numbers. We need to transfer taxes from labour and capital the other way around. I've wrote that wrong late last night with a gin and tonic. So we need to transfer attack, um, taxes. Yes, we do want to transfer taxes from labor and capital to land. That's the simplest thing. Land is, is a, the classical way of talking about ecosystem services. And it is fundamental to a green economy and beavers. Internalize those externalities and we need to recognize those winners and losers. And in that way, beavers could come along in many places and it wouldn't be any problem. It really wouldn't. All the losers would genuinely benefit and all the winners would be no better off except for us all equally.